Neil, you, you are in a group that's obviously very integrated. You offer a, a modality of services, whether it be robot, radiation, active surveillance, uh, obviously e even down the road with your own personal interest in clinical trials. So changing gears a little bit, what, you know, what are your thoughts in terms of trying to identify those, quote, best patients? What is you know, the patient profiles? Uh, you know, what are the things that we need to be looking towards in the future, like, like David had mentioned, to, to try to determine who might be the best candidate for a robot versus IMRT versus active surveillance? Some, just some general thoughts. Well, you know, that's a very complex uh, question with a lot of different parameters that we all struggle with, starting with the fact is, does somebody need anything done and can we just, you know, benefit that patient but with active surveillance versus surgical extirpation and things in the middle, you know, ablative therapies, radi radiation therapies. We base it upon a traditional biopsy findings and digital rectal exam, age, comorbidities, um, and histopathology, PSA, et cetera. I think what's exciting now are some of the new uh, biomarkers that we're looking at and some of the uh, new prognostic indicators uh, based upon tissue biopsy samples. So in addition to our, our historical uh, set of parameters, we're now uh, looking into uh, epigenetic markers, we're looking at uh, cell cycle gene sequences. Uh, and I think that there's great promise to uh, ultimately allow us to make better selection of who needs to be treated or who can be followed, uh, and, if, and if treated, uh, how aggressively they should be treated. The challenge for all of us, uh, whether we be a radiation oncologist or urologist or, or medical oncologist, is we have a plethora of options for localized therapy. And, um, uh, there are a lot of uh, different um, factors which might influence one's decision and I think it was said earlier, you know, if you have a hammer, you're looking for nails. One of the things I've always enjoyed about the large group integrative model, much like the academic center model, if it's done correctly, is to allow for uh, tumor boards and centers of excellence to really explore what's in the best interest of the patient. I think that's where we uh, will do our best service. We need to hold that ground. It's very important, I think, for the integrity of our specialty and not be told by third-party payers or uh, government uh, uh, agencies how we should be uh, making those decisions. And there's no doubt that the, the practice of urology is under attack. The urologists, for the most part, we, we believe in what we do. We, we, we are the purveyors, like we talked about, of prostate cancer. We've set up our models so that we can offer integrated services, from diagnosis, treatment, and now, obviously, into advanced treatment. Uh, obviously, this, this creates a little bit of a controversy with some of our colleagues, and, and we continue to be attacked. There are many, many people that want the Stark in-office ancillary service exception to go away, which obviously allows us to do the things that we do. But I think it's my personal belief that I think an integrated model, whether it be a single specialty and probably a larger scheme, a, an integrated system does allow for better care and probably allows for a more efficient and possibly less expensive care. But it, again, it has to be coordinated in a certain fashion. Uh, to allow that, and, and I think that is that is integral to to our business model.